And it is by far the thing we spend the most money on in turf grass. It's what distinguishes grass from vegetables and all that other stuff. Is it will it can evolve under grazing to be able to grow and survive under those pressures. And we've increased those pressures by getting out there and mowing. Oh, that was the wrong way. So there's uh, about as far as you can take that mowing out in the desert. But that's where it started. And it's kind of a joke, but we'll call that the flock mower. That's the, the flock of sheep. And they, this golf course does not mow anything but fairways and groups. The sheep keep this golf course very playable in the rough. And that's probably what native turf looked like. That's a, that's a U.S. Open in the 90s. That was probably the epitome of stupid mowing. They walk mowed everything in Congressional for that. It looked like there were stripes everywhere. They had every walk mower in the entire D.C. area. They walk mowed er the fairways. So. I think... And here is Augusta. Are there any lines and stripes at Augusta? No, they go all one way. So, this is really But um, we'll, we'll move on from there. So, there's the first lawnmower. Um, Edwin Budding, that will be on your test. Um, that's, that's one that's been on the turf bowl a bunch. That's just a question that's in turf grass curriculum, so I'm not going to change that. He was a textile engineer. They invented the first mower to cut the nap and make the, the rugs with it. Interestingly enough, he's the, the same industry invented the microscope so they could look at the, the fibers on rugs. And there's a museum over there that has a lot of these old mowers. Actually, Michigan State University, the Turfgrass Club, they restore old mowers like this, and they have a lot of them in a museum. So that's kind of a fun project thing that they do. Um, there's a fly mower. That's probably you know as excessive a mower as you can get there on number 12 at Augusta. And we talked about this a little bit last time. So before Budding invented the real mower, we had the flock out there mowing. Um, three men mowing better than eight with size in a broom. So it took three men to mow with it. Two pulled and one kind of directed it. And, and they used to have guys out there. When you know what a size is, like the Grim Reaper? Yeah, there's a picture. Uh, when George Thompson first got his job at Columbia Country Club, there's a picture of his crew. And there's a guy there with a sock. And that was the weed whacker. He said, so all you guys when you're out there with the weed whacker saying how much you hate that job, we could trade and give you a sod or do that job. And this guy was amazing. He did a great job. So Is that the same as a sickle? I think it's just it's a, a little bit different. Yeah, it's it's a little bit of a different shape. A side is for the field, they used to ha harvest wheat with it. A sickle, I think, is more the Grim Reapers thing. And then uh, in 1919, the first uh, moto mowers or gas mowers were invented in Detroit. So, you know, same guys doing cars, uh, doing mowers. Um, there's some British lawnmowers pulled by a horse, and you see they had uh, things put on the horse's feet so that the shoes wouldn't hurt the turf. Here's one of the first, these are, this is actually a picture of the guys at Pinehurst. <coughs> this is what they used to mow the greens with. So can you imagine going out 
And it was against the company policy to carry a wrench if you were a mower. Because, as you can imagine, the way the bed, the bed knife is adjusted properly, it's rubbing. It's a lot harder to push. So guys would move the bed knife off so it wouldn't cut, and so it was much easier to push. So one of the tricks of the old superintendent, he used to go up to a guy and he'd look at the mower and say, give me a wrench. The guy came in with a wrench. He was fired. Uh, they were not allowed to carry a wrench. But this is uh, Smith Turf and Irrigation has had that at the show a few years back. What kind of mower was that? Um, that's just a, a, a push mower, real, real push mower. And then here's, not much has changed um, from that. This is Piner's number two, and they're pulling a, a gain unit. And if this is sharp and working well, this is a fine unit. You, you don't need to spend a fortune to, to, to mow. You can do a good job. But the, the, sh the quality of the cut is the most important thing, not the quality of the machine. And you can spend a ton. Um, I'm going to give you a little trick. This is, this is called a bat wing. This is a pretty popular mower right now, particularly for growing, cutting Bermuda grass. Because what happens with the real mower, the reels might be the radius of the reel might be this high. If any grass is longer than that, it doesn't go in the reel. It gets pushed over and never pops back up. So the seed heads on Bermuda grass grow so fast that they won't cut with the real mower. That's why we'll use what's, this is a rotary mower or a bat wing. And one of the things to, to, to safety with this is very important. People lose their fingers a lot in this industry, their fingers and toes. So one of the safety tricks is they get, get a, order chicken for your crew one day and, and grab a wing and have that thing going and stick a chicken wing in there and show them what that does to a chicken wing. And that kind of sticks in people's heads. And this is, that's one thing that the John Deere engineers do it for training for, for safety is uh, cut the fingers off of a chicken wing and it kind of gives them uh, something. The more blades, and these are the blades, the finer the cut is. So your greens mowers, these are going to be closer and you'll have a lot more. Each one of these cuts like a scissors as it goes around. It goes across the bed knife and it cuts. The fewer of these, the more you can get more solid. And has everybody seen it where it looks wavy? If you're riding a mower and it looks wavy, you're driving too fast for the, the machine. And mowing is one of those things that you're much better off to pull back the throttle a little bit, to go a little bit slower, the machines work a lot better. Running those machines full throttle, they're not meant to be run like that. They're meant to be run pulled back a little bit. It saves gas. It, it does better quality. You're able to see what's going on. So it's something that you really don't want to rush. What was that term that you were saying? Oh, the waves? Marsaling. Marsaling? Yeah. Is that the, yeah, that's the Marsaling. I think it'll be in here in a little bit, but um, when they're hydraulically driven, the blades will spin, can spin a little bit faster. The one that I showed you before, this has a gear system, so the reel spins a lot more than the thing. Okay. So training is important. You probably shouldn't be two guys riding on a mower, but here's some training going on. Um, mowing is, uh, sharpening the mowers is very important. This is a pretty snazzy thing. Hydraulic lift comes up out of the floor, allows the mechanic to work on that. Um, okay. This is a concept that I want you to get. Mowing stresses the plant. Okay. When you cut the cuticle, you allow fungi to get in there. Um, you decrease photosynthesis. Carbohydrates go down. You're separating carbohydrates from the plant. So all those things are a stress. So the more you take off at one time, the more you stress the plant, not the more often you mow. We can mow because the plant has a subapical meristem in a crown. Okay, those are terms you need to know. Um, increased density below the mower, protected bluegrass and tall fescue are less adapted than some lower poish 
a uh, POA can have um, even seed heads at that lower height of cut. Um, Stoloniferous species are better adapted for lower heights of cut. And here's your most important rule. The Stoloniferous grasses. Creeping bent, colonial bent and bent, yeah. Any of the stolen first. Mowing. It's all about mowing. Mowing at a lower height of cut. There's a push to have lower and lower heights of cut. Never remove more than a third of the surface at any one time. Um, that will stop root growth. Um, scalping, protecting bluegrass for those grasses beginning of the season. The one-third rule is really important. Basic. Um, memorize it, learn it, don't do it. So um, you want to scalp the bluegrass season? Is that what that's saying? I'm not sure what that's saying. Um, why don't you stop dry grass before the fruit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Is that like hard to plan up to? It's something from. Though it's not in McCarthy's book. That's from. Oh, that's from that book. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would disregard it again. It's not a practice I've ever done. Um, I think what it's talking about is getting rid of some of that plant material so the new plant material can come up through it when it starts growing, but it's not a big thing that anybody in here is going to worry about. It's yeah, zoysia, zoysia can create a lot of mass up there on top where the new plants can't get through. But it's, it, it's more something that you would want to airify, I think, would be a better way to solve that problem. When you scalp the plant, it goes into shock, and it will, it, the roots will come up. Yeah, roots. The roots match root depth matches shoot height really closely, actually. So when you have the more you take off the top, it prunes the roots, and that goes back to the video. Remember that we watched right at the beginning, the Michael Pollan video. He talked about that causing that. That's a fertilizer by, by by taking a field of grass that's really high and chopping it down it'll kill all those roots off and that fertilizes, the, that builds the soil. That's the soil building process he was talking about. So that, that's important. And I'm, I'm not going to mess with this, but this is important for you and your project. So whichever grass you have, these are recommendations from the book for cutting heights. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those. You can look at that. So, um, the one-third rule is really important. The more you mow, the more healthy the plant is going to be. The less you take off each time you mow, the better off you're going to be. Well, they, they say that uh, scalp of Kentucky bluegrass removing dead tissue promotes yeah, dense so tissue. Removing, yeah, no, you're removing dead tissue at the beginning right. by scalping. Right. So that makes some sense. I would be careful about that because what else can that do? What's that going to open the plants up? Probably even simpler fungus, maybe, but what, what George was talking about last week? Oh, weeds. 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 Right? You really want to have dense turf. The best defense against weeds is a healthy turf. And some mass up there, so. Do clippings add to thatch? No. no. They don't. We, we would think that they would, but they don't. Um, but when you start to get thatch, and those are the thatchy grasses that they're talking about scalping that stuff off um, and scalping off rise on stolons and, and this is a grade and this is a verticutting machine so that that's a different way of mowing more vertically which gets some of that material out of there um, okay. What do I want to say about this? <laughs> There's a lot of art to mowing. Okay, how it looks is an important part of it.
People do something called burning in here on Bermuda grass, where they like lines and they want you to mow the same direction over and over and over again. That will create some sort of grain and it will create compaction. Is it worth it? Depends. Do what your boss tells you to do. Think about why it's wrong and why you're going to do it different later when you're the boss. And somebody else will second guess you. But it's a boss decision. It's, it's not your decision. Um, I like the Augusta I, way of mowing or even down and back with, where there's only one line down the middle. I prefer that as a player, shadow cut, we call that Scottish cut, shadow cut. I prefer that personally, but Bill Patton is a stickler about lines. He wants really straight lines, particularly in the fairway where members can see that. So that's the Robert Trent Jones school of mowing. So there's a lot of different schools. Yeah. On greens, you're going to mow at the clock, you know, three to six, six to nine. You're, every day you'll mow a different direction to get rid of the grain, right, to try to keep that away. And you can see where you've mowed. But sometimes pine needles, I know, does what they call burn-in for the tournament, and they drive the mowers down the same tracks, the same direction, every time they mow. I'm not a big fan of that, but who am I to criticize Dave for doing that. You mean on the fairways? On the fairways. Right. Not on the greens. The green, everybody rotates around on the greens. Um, so we're going to talk about plant growth regulators a little bit. This is chemical mowing, um, stopping, or chemicals that will slow growth. Pretty, they have a lot of applications on roadsides. A lot of the mowing on roadsides now is done with chemicals. There's the shadow cut. That, that's what I like. And that, that's Bermuda grass growing about as, that's about as green as you can get Bermuda grass. Right there. But that's it. The, they mow one, one way and then back the other. Contour mowing. That's just when you call it contour. Yeah, yeah. And you see that stripe. So. Hormones are a chemical messenger that produce in small amounts in one part of the organism, transported to another part of the organism. Um, what we're going to use, the chemicals we're going to use to chemically mow are growth regulators, and a lot of them are hormones or hormone inhibitors. Um, auxin causes cell elongation, so that's obviously not one we're going to use. That's produced in the shoot marrow stems, young leaves, um, flowers, and fruit. You should know for the test a week from, or two weeks from today, the hormones. Know that auxin causes cell elongation, and it's the one that's used for rooting hormone also. So this is one that's, well, you guys are in propagation class now? Bring this up, okay. There's some stuff in the garden that's still out there for propagation. I wonder if that's from years past or something. When do you guys have Mr. Obvious plant propagation class? It's in the summer. It's in the summer. You'll be using this to try to stimulate to get the cuttings to root. Those little bags around the... Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. And what... Auxin is kind of cool because it's a shade thing also. It, plants grow... If anybody who's looked at plants, they'll grow to the sun. They'll... A tree will put new leaves out on an area that gets open. The reason for that is auxin because on the shady side, the plant is stimulated to grow faster than on the sunny side, so it'll turn and extend. So shade stimulates oxen production. And it's something worth spending a little time to read about and get in your head. That's kind of cool. Plants can grow to the light. Go ahead. Both sides are going to grow fast. It's going to grow up. That's why some of those little pine trees are as tall as the 50-year-old pine trees because they're getting stimulated with, by the hormone oxen to go up. Right? So really tall, skinny trees where in, in a tree that's in full sun is not going to grow as fast because it's not being stimulated to grow. It's going to grow out and expand at a normal rate. Um, gibberellins cause stem elongation, so similar 
but cell division and enlargement. Okay, the other one was just elongation. This is, uh, and, and this was discovered by, there's a fungus that produces gibberellin. And when a plant gets that fungus growing on it, it grows like mad and called it silly seed. Also, this is a hormone that's used in grape production because it will cause the cells to elongate on the grapes. So they'll spray the grapes with it. And I'm going to show you a picture in a second. Um, well, here's the plant. Gibberellic acid, no gibberellic acid. So that's pretty obvious to see that. Gibberellic acid, no gibberellic acid. Which one would you buy at the store? The right one looks like it's going to be sweeter and nicer, and, and it's just chemically enhanced to just be more full of water. But it sells a lot more grapes. So the type 1 plant growth regulators are absorbed by the foliage. The phytotoxic effect, they can make the plants a little bit yellow. So we're not going to use those on the golf course or a home lawn. But we might on a roadside where we don't care a little bit. And you'll see that. They use these on the roadside. Embark, um, uh, the chemical name meth methudide. Um, sometimes they're used for weed control also. But excellent for roadside. Type 2 inhibit gibberellic acid. So they're gibberellic acid inhibitors. And the most important one that I want you to know is Primo. Primo is a gibberellic acid inhibitor that's used a lot in the turf industry. It really gives the plants great growth characteristics. Where it'll grow laterally, they'll fill out, they'll chemically mow there, it's used a ton here. And these people are brilliant that work for these companies. They figured it out. The cost of Primo is about exactly the cost of what it costs to mow, to pay a guy to mow and to run the mower. So um, you can save labor by spraying Primo. And a lot of times what they'll do is the superintendent will watch the weather. If he sees a big storm coming in the summer when he's mowing his Bermuda grass every two days, and he knows he's not going to be able to mow for a day, he'll get out there before the storm and spray the Primo so that he will not break the one-third rule when he comes back and he doesn't have to raise his mowers. But if you don't get out there, you need to raise the height of cut on your mowers and then bring the cut back down. Because if you break that one third row, you're going to stress the plant out so much, take away the sugars, and, and, and pull it back. So mowing is, keeping an eye on your mowing is, is important. And this is another tool that we can use. Um, and again, this is less phytotoxic, and it, it does not that big a deal on the, the POA. Seed head control. So Primo, very important topic. Gibberellic acid inhibitors, very important topic. Subclass 2, uh, let's not worry about that. Just worry about that Primo is a type 2. Um, TGR and Cutlass, these are the ones more for POA control, but we're not going to worry about that for this class. So just know that there are gibberellic acid inhibitors out there, and they do what exactly what they sell. So you need to know what gibberellic acid does. And you need to do, know what something that inhibits that would do. I'm not going to talk about Rubigan for this class. Um, so some of the cons. Phytotoxicity is a great vocabulary word. Um, it's hard to get the application uniform. So that will show up if you overlap or if you get the rate wrong. Primo goes on in very, very small rates. So I've seen a golf course where they sprayed 100 times the rate by accident. It, the grass was the color of Mark's shirt. It was orange. And that was a, they had to actually go out and spray gibberellic acid to get that grass to start growing. So they were able to, to do that. But then they had a whole sprayer filled with this 100 times rate. And they were using that sprayer. They were, they were actually having to dip out of that sprayer to fill another sprayer to spray. So they sprayed the whole golf. They were spraying the driving range and the rough and everywhere just to use that stuff up. So it was a, a pretty um, bad mistake. 
And uh, again, the, the pros would be that chemical mowing, labor saving stuff. So, so you might choose to budget some primo applications for your field. And that would probably be a good thing to do. But you're going to have to do a little bit of research to figure out what that, that's going to cost. And, and I bet it's going to cost about exactly what it costs to mow. Because they're, they're good at, over there at uh, Syngenta. So we're going to talk about shade a little bit. Right, we'll go back to our photosynthesis. Remember, when you put the grass plant in shade, you're starving it. Our photosynthesis, we can't, it's very difficult to photosynthesize in the shade. The turf in the shade is going to have a lower temperature. And Jeff was talking about that this morning. Just he didn't really realize until he started growing these plants how important temperature is for plant growth. Um, he didn't, it, the chlorophyll, um, there'll be higher humidity in the shade, which makes for more disease. Uh, the trees have roots that compete. Um, some species are going to be better than others. Um, fine fescue, poa triv, tall fescue, uh, zoysia. Um, these are the grasses. You probably should know that. Fine fescue for shady dry, poa trivialis for shady wet, tall fescue in the south, and zoysia grass is better than Bermuda grass. But it's still not going to be as good as the cool season grasses. And then another big problem in the shade is going to be your moss and algae, algae problem. I'm not going to read that to you. Um, I can just show you. Um, moss is a problem, particularly in the mountains here. It shouldn't be a big problem for the horticulture students at that height of cut, but at putting green height of cut, moss is a problem. It's there's very hard to kill moss because it's a non-vascular plant, which has no xylem or phloem, no heart. So all you kill is what you touch, what you, what you contact, and there's always other cells underneath that live. Like mold. Now, mold's a fungi. It does have spores. Yes. Yes. It tra it's transported by spores. So it is like a fungi in that respect, but it's a totally different genus. It's, 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 like, a fung it's like a fungus for a plant, though. It's a primitive plant. It's a very primitive plant. And it's a, a, an aquatic plant. <coughs> and it, photosynthes it photosynthesizes, where. Uh, <coughs> Fungi do not photosynthesize. Fungi are saprophytes. This is an uh, autotrope. Basically, it makes its own food. So it's, they're unique. Um, but they can make grass look pretty bad. Um, there's on the edge. Generally going to come out where the plant is stressed, where we've scalped the edge here. And then there's no sunlight, and the water gets to the soil. A little bit about light. Um, plants absorb light, the, the visible spectrum. Uh, some light is reflected and some light is transmitted. Um, competition from other plants, buildings, shade is going to limit the energy that can be made by the grass. Um, high energy light to low energy light. About red is the longer wavelengths. Chlorophyll absorbs this, these, the blues and the violets, and then the oranges and leaves, green and yellow. That's why we see green and yellow. Chlorophyll A and the chlorophyll B. Shade, plants that are better in the shade are going to have more of this type of chlorophyll, this peak, than this high energy peak, because the high energy peak is taken away by the shade. So some shade plants like hosta might only get that red light, but they're very adapted using that to photosynthesize. So phytochrome, this is a cool thing to put on tests, too. Um, phytochrome is a light-sensitive protein. Remember we talked about proteins before, amino acids? This is a protein that changes when it gets light. I have a question about that. Sure. What is the thing you reference there? Phytochrome? Yeah, the, the protein. You see it, it's just red and then far red. 
same thing, but it doesn't have that P in it. But you just that B is Phytochrome right. red, phytochrome far red. Yeah. And that's confusing. You need to think about it a little bit. You need to get this get your mind around it. The PR is the inactive phytochrome. So it has not been zapped with light. The PFR is the active form that's been zapped with light. So it's a molecule. Picture it. It's a molecule that's in a ball. When it gets zapped with light, think of it as a flower opening up. When it's open, it does stuff. And it does stuff that you would think a plant would do when it has light. It basically does not grow up. When it's down, it causes the plant to push auxin out in that place and to grow up. When it's open, it grows out. Slows stem elongation, expands leaves, induce tillering. So this signals the plant, we've got enough light, we can photosynthesize. This signals to the plant, we're starving, we're in trouble, grow up. Don't expand the leaves, decrease the tillers, go up. We're going for survival, we're going for light. We don't know we're not going to outgrow that giant sequoia tree. We don't know it's a giant sequoia. We might be just trying to outgrow some grass that's right there next to us. We're going to grow as fast as we can. Right, so anybody that's spent any time looking at grass growing in the shade has seen it looks like an Auschwitz victim. It's tall and tiny and thin because it's, it, it's sending out all crisis to use all its sugar to go up. It's going to take away roots. It doesn't need roots if it can't make sugar. It's going to die. It's on its last leg. What can we do as turf managers to help that plant? Cut down trees. We can cut down the trees. That's a good one. What else can we do if our members said, love tree, tree hug, no, don't kill the tree. We love the tree. Put a shade tolerant species. We can use a different species. We can find, we can just say, okay, no grass. If you can have grass or shade. But what else? What can we do with mold? Raise the height of cut and, and mow less. Right? Try to give it some more surface area, bigger plants. What about with irrigation? Probably less. Right? Probably just pull back on it. Try to not have disease. Because it's going mad. It's not making a tough cuticle to keep diseases out. It's making as big a cuticle as fast up as it can. So it's susceptible to all sorts of pests and diseases at this point. There's small things we can do, but not a ton. And it's due to this protein, and it's really an amazing, cool thing. Um, we've got the far red. When the sunlight comes, it goes to PFR. When at night comes, it goes back. So it's always going back and forth. And the ratios of active phytochrome to inactive phytochrome tells the plant what to do. So sometimes if it's shady for weeks and weeks and weeks, we had a year or three or four years back where the zoysia grass just looked terrible. And it was because it had been shady for two or three weeks. That plant needed the phytochrome to be activated so it wouldn't just grow up and look spindly and nasty. So time reverts it back. And that's what all it does is it takes this protein, and you can see the carbon molecules and the nitrogen and the stuff that makes up the protein, and that's in the plant. And when it gets hit with sun, it just it opens. And we can see that. And this has a different response than that. Do they have an effect on like, the hormones? Is that what it, I would say it is a hormone. Yeah. Okay. It, but it, in, it's a different hormone in each different form. But it's oxen, so that would be during the shading. Right, it would it would cause oxen to be released okay. in those cells. And then the PFR might uh, make more. Uh, might say acid. stop. It says stop yeah. making oxen. Gibberellic acid is going to no. Gibberellic acid it would inhibit gibberellic acid. It so it would make it would act like Primo. Okay. This would be doing the same stuff that Primo does. Is a gibberellic acid inhibitor. Remember, gibberellic acid causes the plant to go yeah. up too. So that, that's a little confusing. The two hormones we talked about both do kind of the same thing. One causes elongation, one causes division, but they both cause up. Um, do you guys need a break, or are we good to keep going? Okay.
Um, seed will not germinate without PFR. So that needs light. If there's light there, it'll germinate. Crabgrass seed will last for probably over 100 years now. Dr. Beal at Michigan State did a test where they took grass seeds and they buried a, a whole bunch of seeds from all different weeds and they buried them in little packets all over campus. And every 10 years, they dig one up and they plant the seeds. There's one plant that has germinated every time. Guess what it is? Pardon? Crabgrass, exactly. Crabgrass has germinated every time. So as long as it gets light, it's going to germinate. And it's going to hang out there. So when you have conditions, you will have crabgrass. And it's because of the phytochrome in the seed that activates the growth of the seed. Eulate is when we don't have the active form, and then you, you've seen that, a seed grown totally in the shade. It's white, and it's real tall and spindly. Some of you guys saw that on your grass plants when you planted them. And phototropism is the plants grow to the light. So remember, I love this type of stuff on the test. I love vocabulary, like etiolate, phototropism, auxin. The other thing that will be on the test is cool season grass identification. The same ones that the horticulture students had with Mr. Ivy. Rye, both ryegrasses, Kentucky bluegrass. Poe annual, annual bluegrass, fine fescue, all the cool seasons that we've had so far. We only had five. Okay. Creeping bent, we're going to add to that too. We'll have four on the table. So you have six questions and four. Now we'll have three. It's three to ID. Third of the test. Three grasses to ID. So you'll have to come up and look at three grasses. Okay, another important concept, the low light compensation point. That is the point, and it's a, it's a set place where the plant is only getting enough light to provide for it to stay right where it's at. So if it got any less light, it would die. If it got any more light, it would grow. It would be storing sugar. And different plants have different low light compensation points. Plants with a high low light compensation point mean they, can, they survive worse in the shade the more light they require. So Bermuda grass and St. Augustine have high low light compensation points. Fine fescue and poetry valves have lower low light compensation points. Does that make sense? So there's different low light compensation points by genus to genus bigger, and then within species, they're small. Like L93 might be better than Crenshaw, but not much. Not as measurable as that. Um, okay, so we talked about this before. Raise the height of cut, do not scale. Really, the one third rule, maybe I'd make it a one fourth rule for that. Um, and try to create some air circulation. Pardon? Uh, the one-third rule. Don't scalp. Do, do not scalp. Minimize scalping on the... Pardon? Air circulation? Air circulation is removing trees, fans things like that. Get the green, the grass that's in an area where there's conduction and convection and there's wind will do better than when it's in a pocket where there's no air circulation. Although it will dry out faster. Does that make sense, Owen, or you? Uh, no, I was just going back to the piece. Okay. That's, that's a lot of the reason for mowing directions I've been told. Mowing different directions every time is Who said that? I don't know if I understand that. I, 
I think it's more for player circulation. So that players go and moving the pin is awesome. Yeah, so what? Maybe it's like flipping the grass or something. Anyway, so anyway, so that was pretty fast. Um, <laughs>